Yeah. Tommy Shepard. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank you for giving me my first opportunity to speak in this magnificent chamber. I have the uh, privilege and the honour to represent Edinburgh East. The title of the constituency, I'm sure, like some others, is something of a misnomer. As well as including the eastern parts of our great city, it also embraces most of the city centre of Edinburgh. Uh, therefore, the area is replete with architectural and historical landmarks with which I'm sure you will be extremely familiar. From the castle on Castle Hill, which dominates the city centre, and whose providence makes this place look positively contemporary. <laughs> one, goes down, one goes down the Royal Mile, past the ancient city chambers, the Cathedral of St Giles, down to the bottom to the Palace of Holyrood, and of course, our own Scottish Parliament. The constituency also is the seat of our ancient university, and the area thrives because of the many tens of thousands of students and academics which are within its borders. And at this point, and in relevance to the immigration debate, I would just like to make a point about one of the proverbial babies which I think has been thrown out with the bathwater in recent reforms in immigration, and that is the post-study work visa which used to be afforded to people who came here to study in higher education. This provided students in higher education the opportunity to stay in their community for a short time after finishing their studies uh, to work and, in particular, to give back to that community some of the skills and the experience which they had developed in our own institutions of higher learning. And I would like to think that as this debate <coughs> unfolds and we get down to the detail, we can examine the possibility of getting some replacement mechanism for, for that. Uh, I should also say that the area <coughs> that I represent is a great artistic and creative one. It is the home of the world's largest arts festival, the Edinburgh Festival Fringe, yeah, and yeah, most yeah. of the venues are within my constituency, and I'm personally very proud to have played such a role in developing that festival over the last 10 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. From the city centre, one goes north, just west of the old port of Leith, and then around the coast to the thriving communities of Portobello and of Joppa. It is a rich, diverse, charming area, one in which I am privileged to represent. But I want to just spend a minute uh, saying something about other parts of my constituency, the communities that frankly could be a million miles away from the vibrant and colourful images which adorn our tourist brochures. There's been much talk in this election campaign and already in this debate about aspiration. I know of parts in my constituency where aspiration has all but been extinguished, where families are living on the margins, where despair and desperation hangs over the place in a way which is almost palpable in spite often of public sector investment in infrastructure. And the reason for this can be summed up in one simple word, and that is poverty. There is not enough money in these communities to go round. Yeah. And before anyone says, we are not talking here about the work shy or the feckless. We are talking about the working people to which the Prime Minister referred. Yeah, yeah. People who work a lot harder than any of us have ever done. People who go out and work long hours in insecure jobs for poor pay, who at the end of the week bring home enough just to feed their families, just to get by, but not enough to live a fulfilled life, not enough to enjoy, not enough to have happiness for themselves and their families. And I would implore this chamber that the challenge in front of us in the second decade of the 21st century is surely in such a wealthy country to try and eradicate that poverty that exists. 21% of children in my constituency, and in some areas as many as 50% living in poverty, and it is a scandal. When we talk about this over the coming days, we will discuss the welfare reforms. I would plead with this chamber not to do anything to make matters even worse. Yes. When we hear about the 12 billion cuts that are proposed by the government in the welfare budget, we wait with bated breath to see where they might fall. But I presume you're not going to cut people's pensions, so you are going to look at the very big areas of disability benefits and of tax credits. If you take money out of either of those areas, then you will make a bad situation much worse in some of the areas in my constituency. You will push people to the margins. You will push people in times over the age, and you will complete their alienation from the society in which they live. And I would implore you not to do it. I'd like to spend a word just talking about my predecessor as well, Sheila Gilmore. Sheila was elected in what was then the safe Labour seat of Edinburgh East in 2010, uh, and she has served the area well and to the best of her ability for the last five years, and I wish her well in whatever she does next. 
The reason why Sheila is not here has nothing to do with her capabilities, but everything to do with the predicament into which her party has gotten itself. Yeah. Five years ago, Labour won Edinburgh East with a majority of over 11,000 votes. Three weeks ago, I won the same seat with a majority of over 9,000 votes. Here, here. Oh, well These done. results well have, been completed, uh, have been replicated the length and breadth of Scotland, and they are remarkable, are they not? What has happened has not been a political swing in the normal cephalogical sense of the word. What has happened is a structural shift in political alignment across the communities of Scotland, but most notably in the urban working class communities of Scotland. Yeah, 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 yeah. And to understand what is happening in Scotland, you first have to understand what is not happening in Scotland. And I take offence at those who have suggested that the rise of my party is in some way part of a continuum which has seen the rise of racist and xenophobic organisations throughout this great continent of Europe. It is nothing of the kind. As my friend, the Honourable Member for Edinburgh South West said earlier, our nationalism is an inclusive civic nationalism. Our nationalism is about people having pride in their communities, pride in in their country. It's about empowerment. It's about trying to give people some sense of control over their own lives in a world where global forces make them feel constantly impotent. That is why it resonates with people, many of whom are alienated from the process of government in this country. But there is something else at work as well, and that is this, that our party now exists to put forward not just that civic nationalism, but a credo which is fused also with social democracy and a prospectus that was once the terrain of the Labour Party but which they have now abandoned. That is why that powerful message of people coming together to take control of their own lives and to change the society around them so that it benefits everyone, that is such a potent force and it is why it commands the support of the majority of people in Scotland. I would... um, The... Yeah, I just also want to say, do not, do not mistake our intentions, because there's already been a few jibes about this. Um, we do, of course, want self-government for Scotland. There's no secret of that. But we had a referendum last year, and we, we know the result of that referendum. We lost it. We accept that we lost the referendum. We may not agree with it, but we did. And we did not, in this election, seek a mandate for independence, and we did not get one. And we have not come to this chamber to argue the case for independence. That debate... And the the debate about the next chapter in Scotland's history will take place in a different chamber, in a different parliament, 400 miles to the north of this one. We have come here to give Scotland a strong voice within this parliament. We have come here to represent the people who elected us. And you will find us constructively engaged in order to deliver that. We come here not to disrupt, but to be constructive. We come here to be good parliamentarians and to use the often arcane and antiquated processes that exist in this government for the benefit of the people who elected us. Sometimes there will be a Scottish national interest that we will perceive and we will argue the case for that. But in many other occasions, the interests of our constituents will completely align with the interests of yours. And we hope very much to find common cause and create a united opposition across this chamber in order to prevent some of the worst excesses that may fall upon us from the Conservative government. A government, by the way, which is not one which we wanted. The Conservative Party has not had a mandate in Scotland for some time. It does not have one now. And this is not the result we wanted for the UK, but we accept they won and good luck to them. I would point out, though, that the reason why we have a majority Conservative government is not because the Labour Party lost to the SNP in Scotland, no. it's because the Labour Party lost to the Conservative Party in England. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Even if they had won every single Scottish seat, there would still be a majority Conservative government. So I appeal to the people on these benches to get over it. Let's work, <laughs> let's work together constructively to try and advance as much as we can and try and defend the people that elected us. We were, Mr Speaker, you, you gave us a gentle rebuke uh, yesterday for the <laughs> applause that we give in this chamber and, and, uh, and, and we, 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 we take that uh, with, with good grace. Uh, we, knew, we know of course that it's not traditional practice in the chamber but we didn't know just how unacceptable it might be found but we, we will refrain from doing that again. It will take us time to learn the processes at work here, it will take us time to get our feet under the table. 
and it will take you time to get used to us. But I hope that we will. <laughs> I hope that we'll be able to do that in the weeks and months ahead, and we look forward to working constructively with you on behalf of the people who elected us. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a, a great pleasure to hear from the honourable gentleman, and I know that I'll be joined by a great many colleagues in admiring the spirit of solidarity which motivates large numbers of members of one party to turn up at the same time. And I say that in a spirit of genuine respect. And so thank you for what you have said. I'm in the happy position now of being able to announce the removal of the time limit because we've got a bit more time than we thought. Now that does not mean that the available time should be abused. (laughs) But it is there. (laughs) Mr Philip Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will try and bear in mind that we, it's not Friday today, and uh, and, and take your um, instructions in the spirit in which they're uh, intended. Can I first of all congratulate the honourable gentleman for Edinburgh East on a marvellous um, maiden speech uh, in Parliament? Uh, he said it would take him a while to get his feet under the table, uh, but based on the speech I've just heard, Mr. Speaker, I don't think it will take any time at all for him to get his feet under the table. That was a, a most accomplished uh, performance, and, uh, and from what I've seen, he, he followed his honourable friend for Edinburgh South West, who spoke uh, earlier in the debate, both of which were excellent speeches, and I think from what I've seen so far, I may, may not agree with much of what the SNP say, but there's clearly no doubt of the ability uh, of the people who have been elected from the SNP at the general election. Uh, and the passion with which they argue their cause. And I certainly very much will welcome them uh, to the House of Commons in that spirit, Mr Speaker, even though we may well disagree. But the, the maiden speeches from the two members from Edinburgh were both of an exceptional quality.